So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood. Yes, that's my real name. Go look it up on social media. The link's below if you don't believe me. And today we're talking about Harry Thor, the original killer playboy. And this video is based on an original article by Radu Alexander. If they provided any social links for us, you can find them below alongside my own. But let's get to it. Trial of the Century. It's a short and snappy phrase that grabs people's attention. That's probably why the press had relied on it whenever dealing with a high-profile court case to drum up as much interest as possible for a juicy story to dominate those headlines and column inches. Hey, even we here at Biographics haven't shied away from using that old adage when describing some of the stories we've covered, such as the trial of Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle for the murder of Virginia Rappé, or the trial of Dr. Sam Shepard, who stood accused of killing his wife. Uh, those videos were presented by our previous, far more aerodynamic host, Simon Whistler, who, you know, we wish him all the best, and hopefully I'm doing good in his stead. But today we're going back even further to one of the first cases to ever earn the moniker of Trial of the Century, and to this day is still one of the most intriguing and shocking. The 1906 murder of renowned American architect Stanford White at the hands of the mentally unstable playboy Harry Thor, ostensibly to protect the honour of his wife, famed supermodel, Evelyn Nesbitt. So what made this case so compelling? One contemporary reporter listed all the qualities of this murder scandal that gripped the nation. You see, it had in it wealth, degeneracy, rich old wasters, delectable young chorus girls and adolescent artists, models behind the scenes of theaterdom with the underworld and the great white way, the abnormal pastimes and weird orgies of overly aesthetic artists and jaded debauchees. This is the story of a love triangle that ended in murder and became front page news all over the country as America waited to find out with bated breath, what fate would befall Harry Thor, the killer playboy. Harry Kendall Thor was born February 12, 1871 in Allegheny City, Pennsylvania, today a part of Pittsburgh, to William Thor Sr. and his second wife, Mary Sibbett Copley. To say that Harry was born with a diamond-studded silver spoon in his mouth would still be an understatement. His father was a railroad magnate, estimated to be among the hundred richest people in America at the time. Unsurprisingly, young Harry lacked for nothing in his life, even though from childhood he exhibited paranoid behaviour and was prone to outbursts of violence. At no point did anybody ever really try to do anything to correct his conduct, punish his actions, or even try and get him professional help, since it was probable that he struggled with some kind of mental illness. Instead, if Harry got into trouble at school and got expelled, his father would simply move him to another fancy private school. Yeah, the, the, the Patrick solution from SpongeBob, just like, take the problem, move it somewhere else. From a young age, Harry was taught that his money and social status placed him above the rules of society, which were used to govern us mere mortals. Acting the way he did, Harry never really did well in school, but this mad little. When it was time for college, his father made sure that he got accepted into the University of Pittsburgh to study law. There was little studying to be had though, and soon enough, Harry would have even less incentive to do so. In 1889, William Thor died, leaving behind a giant trust fund for Harry and a generous yearly allowance. And by generous, we mean more money than most mere mortals could spend in several lifetimes. Harry Thor was now a very, very rich man and free to indulge in his every whim. And not that his father was ever a drill sergeant or anything when it came to raising him, but his mother was even more nonchalant about his behaviour. Uh, he was her first child, so he was the apple of her eye, and throughout the rest of her life she would always be more concerned with protecting her son from the consequence of his actions, rather than trying to get him to rein in his ways and stop being a d Up until this point, Harry wanted to attend the University of Pittsburgh because it meant he could go home to his palatial estate instead of living in a cramped dormitory. Now, however, finding suitable living arrangements was no longer a concern, so he used his newfound wealth to transfer to Harvard. And this was only done for bragging rights, and so that Thor could say he attended the prestigious Harvard University. Just like before, he had no interest in any of the scholarly pursuits that college had to offer. Once, when asked what he studied at Harvard, Thor jokingly replied, Poker which had been complemented by bouts of all-night drinking binges and attending cockfights, as well as a string of quick and sultry romances. The all-night drinking sounds like my nights at college, none of the other stuff. Why is it with rich people like cockfights? Who wants to see a chicken tear another chicken apart? Instead of, you go on an all-night drinking binge and then you tear the chicken apart, as part of a KFC. Money might have gotten Thor through the door of Harvard, but it didn't keep him there. It would seem that he went a step too far one night when he chased a cab driver armed with a shotgun. Thor's defence was that the weapon was unloaded, but the university president probably had to deal with one too many spoiled brats that day and expelled him. 
Poor Harry was thrown out onto the streets, but then he remembered, oh, I'm a millionaire and I can do whatever the hell I want. And he cheered up a little bit. After he was done with his quote unquote education, he spent his time between Albany and New York City with frequent trips to Europe where he would let loose a little and unwind after all those stressful months of doing nothing back at home. He was already starting to develop a reputation. His parties and his antics were becoming well known, both in New York and in Europe in the press. There was even a popular new word used to describe the lifestyle of someone like Harry Thor, that of a playboy. Harry Thor might be the guy whose name is in the title of this video, but he only makes up one third of our lethal love triangle. So let's move on to his other two bedfellows. First up is Evelyn Nesbitt, a woman once dubbed the most beautiful artist model in the world, and regarded by some as the world's first true supermodel. With that kind of claim to fame, it's no surprise really that men were willing to quite literally kill for her. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Florence Evelyn Nesbitt was born on Christmas Day oh. in 1884 in a small community just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The family moved to the city a few years later, where Evelyn's father, Winfield Scott Nesbitt, worked as a lawyer who was struggling to make ends meet. Things got significantly worse when Winfield Scott passed away, leaving his family in debt without a source of secure income. It was a desperate time for the Nesbitts, but fortunately for them, Evelyn grew into a stunning beauty from a young age. She was first asked to pose for a portrait by an artist from Philadelphia when she was only 13 years old. Afterwards, she posed for a photographer and her pictures made it into art magazines that garnered a lot of attention. It wasn't long before she was one of the most in-demand models in Philadelphia, and the money she was earning was enough to support her young family. Seeing this, Evelyn's mother realised that this could not only be a viable, but highly lucrative career for her daughter. So in 1900, the two packed their bags and moved to New York City in the hopes they would strike it big. And indeed, they did. Word of Evelyn's transcendental beauty had already reached the city, and it wasn't long until the 15-year-old model was sought out by some of the biggest artists in the country. James Carroll Beckwith was the first painter in New York City to take young Evelyn under his wing, and he introduced her to many prominent names in the art world. She posed as a Gibson girl for Charles Downer's Gibson drawings, Women, The Eternal Question, and George Gray Bernard's sculpture, Maidenhood, parentheses, innocence. Not to mention countless magazines such as Harper's Bazaar and Vanity Fair. But it was in Gibson's studio that Evelyn met the third and final piece of our puzzle, a man by the name of Stanford White. 30 years her senior, ew, Stanford White was already one of the biggest hotshots in the architectural world by the time he met Evelyn. He had made his name and his fortune by mainly designing lavish mansions for the rich and the famous, but he also had several notable landmarks to his credit, such as the Washington Square Arch in Manhattan, Tiffany's Jewelry Store, and the second incarnation of Madison Square Garden. White was also the kind of man who got what he wanted, and once he set his eyes on Evelyn, he decided he wanted her. By that point, the young model was looking to expand her horizons and join the world of theatre, getting a part in one of the most popular Broadway shows of the early 20th century, a musical comedy titled Floridora. The play featured a line of beautiful chorus girls of which Evelyn was now a part, collectively known as the Floridora Girls. This also meant that Stanford White could see Evelyn whenever he wanted to. At first, he played the role of a benevolent benefactor. He started out with some compliments, then he bought Evelyn a few gifts, and before you know it, he was putting her up in a luxurious apartment and giving her an allowance. Of course, all of this was simply the prelude to what White was really after. One night, Evelyn's mother was away in Pittsburgh visiting relatives, and it was just the two of them, and White made his move. Again, I reiterate, ew. What exactly happened that night depends on whose account you believe, but at best, the architect got a 16-year-old girl drunk and took advantage of her. At worst, he drugged and raped her. She was 16, it was rape. What an a Evelyn, despite her beauty and success from an early age, was still naive and inexperienced. The influence and control that White had exerted over her was too strong, so even after what happened that night, the two began an affair. No, it's, it's not an affair, it, it's, it's child abuse. Their relationship, if we can call it that, no we can't, lasted for about a year before the architect grew bored of the chorus girl. This was standard practice for Stanford White. Sorry, let me just rephrase that. This was standard practice for known Stanford White. Evelyn Nesbitt was not the first girl to receive the treatment, nor would she be the last. His reputation as a predator who targeted young women was well known in New York's high society, as evidenced by none other than Mark Twain, who briefly wrote about the murder trial in his autobiography. Here is what the novelist had to say about Stanford White. The witness charges the middle-aged architect with eagerly and diligently and ravenously and remorselessly hunting young girls to their destruction. These facts have been well known in New York for many years, but they've never been openly proclaimed until now. On the witness stand, in the hearing of a courtroom crowded with men, the girl told in the minutest detail the history of White's pursuit of her, 
even down to the particulars of his atrocious victory. A victory whose particulars might as well be said to be on principle. New York City has known for years that the highly educated and elaborately accomplished Stanford White was a shameless and pitiless wild beast disguised as a human being. And few, if any, have doubted that he ought to have been butchered long ago by some kindly friend of the human race. During one of Stanford White's famous parties, Evelyn made the acquaintance of 21-year-old John Barrymore, part of the illustrious Barrymore acting family, and the two quickly became smitten with one another. Although John Barrymore would go on to achieve great fame in his career, this version of him, however, was a young, struggling artist who mainly did illustrations for newspapers and the like. Evelyn's mother did not approve of their budding romance, so when Barrymore proposed marriage, she sent her daughter away to a boarding school in New Jersey. When she was still performing on Broadway, Evelyn followed up her successful stint in Floridora with a part in The Wild Rose, where she had a more prominent role instead of simply being a chorus girl. Once again, she dazzled her adoring public, and among the audience, left smitten by her beauty, was none other than the villain of today's piece, Harry Thor. At first, Harry tried to win Evelyn over under the guise of Mr. Munro, and sent her lots of expensive flowers after each performance of The Wild Rose, often accompanied by a $20 or even $50 bill. What a romantic. But this alone was hardly enough to make Evelyn swoon. After all, she had plenty of rich men vying for her affection. She was not impressed and had most of the gifts sent back. Eventually, Thor tries scheduling a lunch date with the actress through a common acquaintance, and as it happened, he picks the perfect time. Evelyn was feeling pretty down about the whole having to return to boarding school and being abused thing, so she thought she might as well meet up with the mysterious and friendly Mr. Monroe. At the very least, it might make for an intriguing interaction. When the two were face to face, the playboy dropped the fake name and facade and announced himself proudly as Harry Thor of Pittsburgh, his favourite way of introducing himself. But this left the actress more bemused than impressed. The luncheon did not go particularly well, and Evelyn felt relief when Thor departed. But he was not the kind of man to give up so easily. He continued his dogged pursuit of her, partly out of passion, but also out of desire to harm and humiliate Stanford White. You see, when and how exactly the animosity between the two men started, we cannot say. We can tell you that Harry Thor loathed the architect before he'd ever heard of Evelyn Nesbitt. This may have all begun with a single bad interaction at a party, but in Thor's paranoid mind, he soon became convinced that Stanford White had made it his mission to turn him into a social pariah, and used his many connections to deny Thor entry into the most prestigious clubs in New York, such as the Metropolitan, the Knickerbocker, and the Players Club. It couldn't be that he was just a paranoid Anyway, the playboy millionaire kept trying to woo Evelyn, although he had more success winning over the girl's mother than Evelyn herself. Then an opportunity presented itself for Thor to show his dedication towards the young actress. Evelyn fell ill with appendicitis, being there. While she was recuperating, she stayed in a sanatorium in New York City, and as you would expect, both White and Thor visited her often to lavish her with gifts and attention. However, by the time she returned home, White was starting to get bored with her and was ready to move on to the next showgirl. Harry pounced on this moment and convinced Evelyn's mother to let him take her daughter on an extended trip to Europe in May 1903 to aid in her recovery. I guess just 1903 was just a different, just let your child go with a mysterious millionaire stranger time. At first, he was the perfect gentleman, even as Evelyn continuously rebuffed his offers of marriage and romance. Then, things changed when he finally got her to recount how Stanford White took advantage of her. Outwardly, he was caring and consoling towards Evelyn. He said all the right things, but there was a definite change in his demeanour. He became colder and started making snide remarks, not only towards White, but also towards Evelyn. While visiting Dom Raimi, the birthplace of Joan of Arc, Thor wrote in the guest book that she would not have been a virgin if Stanford White had been around. Just, um, pro tip for any women watching, if guys start talking like this, leave. Just go. It's not worth it. Just throw the whole man out. While in Austria-Hungary, Thor rented out Kassenstein Castle, where the couple stayed for a few weeks. In that remote edifice, where the two were isolated and alone, except for a few servants who stayed at the opposite end of the castle, Evelyn saw, for the first time, the true Harry Thor. One night, he burst into her room naked. He began tearing at her nightgown and whipping her violently with a riding crop. The harder she fought, the harder he hit her, till the body was full of long, bloody lacerations. He then proceeded to assault her the same way as White had done years earlier. The attack stopped as suddenly as it began. Afterwards, Thor got up calmly, left the room, and locked the door behind him. The next day, he acted as if nothing had happened, and the European tour continued. It wasn't until October that Evelyn arrived back in New York City, but Thor continued his pursuit, though undeterred, and shockingly, it worked. Perhaps Evelyn felt trapped between two violent, domineering men, and was obviously getting no help from her mother, 
like where was she in all of this and thought that she had no choice but to choose one of them the lesser of two evils as it were perhaps she thought that as word spread around town that she was stanford white's mistress her chance of finding a respectable and loving husband would go down dramatically or perhaps she actually believed Thor when he said that he was a changed man and was won over by his continuous gestures of generosity and affection. Whatever the case, after two years of courtship, as it's uh, generously put in the original article, Evelyn agreed to marry Harry Thor. The couple got hitched on April 4th, 1905, and the newspapers proclaimed Evelyn Nesbitt to be the mistress of millions. Before their wedding, Thor had promised Evelyn that he would behave like a Benedictine monk from then on. He even had the audacity to tell her that he forgave her for the relationship with White. You know, the relationship where she was raped. The couple moved to the family mansion in Pittsburgh, where Thor seemingly did adopt a calmer, more approachable human demeanour, likely because he was around his own mother. One thing that did not change, however, was his intense hatred of Stanford White, and he took up a moral campaign to try and expose him as the true blackguard that he was. Evelyn, meanwhile, was bored and largely resigned herself to the quite depressing existence she found herself in. She spent most of her days cooped up inside with her mother-in-law and her friends. She barely saw anyone her own age or received any social invitations. After about a year of marriage, Thor decided to take Evelyn on another trip to Europe with a short stop in New York City to enjoy a bit of high society. While in the city, the couple decided to catch a play. And on June 25th, 1906, it was the opening night for Mademoiselle Champagne, playing on the rooftop theatre of Madison Square Garden. Thor bought tickets and they went to see the play. During the show, guess who showed up? It was none other than Stanford White, who had his own private table, since remember, he did design the building. As the finale of the play was approaching on stage, a singer was belting out, I could love a million girls, when the entire audience was startled by three gunshots. They looked around and saw Harry Thor, pistol in hand, standing over White's now dead body, his face almost unrecognisable, covered in blood and gunpowder. At that point, Harry shouted something nobody paid close attention to the exact wording of, but it was something to the effects of, I did it because he ruined my wife. Again, Lady Ron. Then, when he was taken into custody, he simply reiterated that White had gotten what he deserved. Harry Thor was arrested, charged with first degree murder, and imprisoned in the Manhattan Detention Complex, aka the Tombs. However, the preferential treatment Thor received in prison still made his life better than 99% of the country. He slept in a big brass bed instead of a regular jail cot, was allowed to wear his tailor suit instead of a prisoner's uniform, received catered meals from fancy restaurants, and even had daily allowances of wine and champagne brought to him. Unsurprisingly, he was in an almost constantly happy mood, not just due to his living conditions, but also because he was convinced the world would see him as a hero for ridding it of a scoundrel like Stanford White. The trial of the century began on January 25th, 1907. The defence wanted to declare Harry Thor insane, but he was not having any of that. Neither was his mother, who was fiercely protective of her family's reputation. Her son had murdered someone in front of a hundred witnesses. Instead, Mother Thor hired a new legal team led by Delphine Delmas and told them to pursue a defence of temporary insanity or a brainstorm as they referred to it back then. In fact, Delmas even introduced a new term to explain Thor's sudden and unexpected bout of violence, Dementia Americana. He argued that there are certain things that are sacred to the American man the honour of his wife being chief among them. So it was understandable, even justifiable, that Thor temporarily lost control of his senses in order to avenge the honour of his wife. And here's the thing, some jury members actually bought this. The first trial deadlocked seven to five in favour of guilty. The second trial began in January 1908 and lasted only a month. This time, Thor's team went after the insanity defence without any bells and whistles, and it worked. Harry Thor was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was committed to a state hospital for the criminally insane. Obviously, his team went immediately to secure his release, but this didn't work. So in 1913, they just busted him out. They colluded with a keeper to get Thor out of the building and transported him over the border to Canada, where another team of high-priced lawyers had already secured the rights to fight any extradition attempts. It wasn't until 1915 that he was extradited to New York when he was charged with conspiracy to escape. Conspiracy? He was in Canada! I, I get it, I, you know, the... the the, the gears of the legal system move slowly, but they do grind finely. But conspiracy to escape when he's already escaped seems like, you know, a bit lacking in regards to, like, you know, the severity of what you tried to accuse the person of. 
Two trials later, and on July 16, 1915, Harry Thor was declared not only legally sane, but also a free man, since technically he couldn't be tried again for the same murder he'd already stood trial for. Which I didn't think was a re I didn't think double jeopardy was a real thing, but here we are. The district attorney rightfully decried this decision as a gross miscarriage of justice, made possible only thanks to Thor's vast fortune and his mother's own machinations. Just rich people don't go to jail the same way, do they? And did Thor learn a lesson? No. Uh, once he was free, he divorced Evelyn and went to California, where he once again indulged in bouts of sadism. Less than a year later, he was charged with beating and whipping a 19-year-old boy called Fred Gump. Thor fled from the police, and when they finally caught with him in Philadelphia, he tried to commit suicide by slashing his own throat. He survived, but this was enough to get him declared insane again and sent to an asylum again. No escapes this time, and Thor spent seven years in there before being released. After that point, he stayed away from the headlines. If he continued his streak of violence and cruelty, he managed to do it without anyone really finding out. And he died on February 12th, 1947. He was 76 years old. For anyone curious about Evelyn's fate, uh, she did have a child with Thor, or at least she claimed, because Thor disowned the child and claimed it wasn't his. After their divorce, she was forced to earn an income and return to the stage, appearing in a couple of silent films, before finding steady and long career in vaudeville and cabaret shows. She died on January 17th, 1967. She was 82 years old. So thank you for tuning into this episode of Biographics. As noted at the start, I've been your interim host, Carl Smallwood. Yes, it's my real name. You can find links to my socials below, in addition to links to my own channel, where I have a decidedly more lax and less professional approach than I do here, if you can believe it. As mentioned, this video is based on an original article by Radu Alexander. Find links to their stuff below. It also linked below will be like, you know, the sources used, the original article, and just, you know, our sister channels, Geographics and Top Tens, on which I'm also the interim host. Like, you know, we appreciate everyone for watching this video. If you like the video, leave a like. If you have anything to say about it, please leave a comment. And specifically, I'd like to request any feedback on my hosting style, because I am trying to um, uh, fit with the top 10s, geographics and biographic brands as best as I can, but I'm by no means a professional voice actor or indeed person in front of camera. Host, that's the word. Um, I was a writer for um, Sister Site Top 10s for many years, though, and have like you know experience running my own YouTube channel. Either way, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this. Subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, have the day you all deserve. Cheers. Also, just don't be a d to women.